Um, I'd like you to look up, and you have your pew Bibles. I even borrowed one of the pew Bibles so that we'd all be reading in the same thing. Is when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Paul writing says, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. It's not as good as the King James in my opinion, but I think it gets the idea across. The things you find in the Bible, they were written down as examples for us and as warnings for us upon whom it really means the end of the ages is come, meaning the people who are living in the last days of Earth's history should understand that everything in this book was written as an example and as a warning to you, specifically, our generation. We who are now living, this book was given for us specifically. When you read the Bible, you should always have that text in the back of your mind. All of this is given to us who are living now just before Jesus comes. So with that in mind, I thought about Paul's last journey to Jerusalem, as found in Acts, more or less from chapter 19 to 22. Those chapters record Paul's last journey to Jerusalem. And the story more or less begins in Ephesus. And you could say, where does the church's story begin? Revelation tells us it begins where? In Ephesus. Where does our story begin? In a sense, our story begins in Ephesus. Because what is at the heart of the church of Ephesus? It had forgotten its first love. And it needed to come back to its first love. This also talks about the remnant. Where does the remnant's story begin? It begins in Ephesus, because the Laodicean condition has caused the church to lose its first love. And it needs to find its first love. And Paul's last journey to Jerusalem is the remnant's last journey. And it is very much a parallel to Christ's last journey to Jerusalem. So both Christ's last journey to Jerusalem and Paul's last journey to Jerusalem is instructive for God's last day people as they are going to not old Jerusalem, but the new Jerusalem. And so there are things in that story we need to take knowledge of. And so I ask you to turn in the book of Acts to chapter 19. And we are going to do some reading 
quite a bit of reading, really. Starting at verse 1 in chapter 19, it says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Now when you hear that term, the way, what do you, or what should you understand when they say the way? That is Christians, okay? Because Jesus says, I am the truth and the way and the life. And so many Christians would say, I'm part of the way, meaning I'm part of Christ's way. So to be part of the way was to be a Christian. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, remember I'm asking you to imagine this Paul is the remnant church. This is you. All right? This is the remnant church. What did the remnant church do in these verses here? It brought the truth to some who only had a partial knowledge of the Bible. And when they explained the truth more fully to those who only had a partial understanding of the truth, they became convicted and were baptized, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they then joined in giving a prophetic message, because it says they prophesied. Does not Revelation 10 say, you shall prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues? Yes. So here is our job, and as we bring it to other people, they will be so touched with the Spirit of God that they are then filled with a spirit to go and prophesy the, and give the same truth. And miracles follow them. The spirit of prophecy says, in these last days, the remnant church will do what? Perform miracles. And these are as we get closer to the end. Ah, but some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of his house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear 
and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So what kind of things are God's remnant going to come in contact with? False revival. You are going to see a false revival that is going to be powered by the spiritual dimension, but not God's spiritual dimension. And they too will do miracles. In the name of who? Jesus. But in some of these situations, even though they were able to do miracles in the name of Jesus, God will show them to be false prophets and false healers, and he will do this in such a marvelous way that people will recognize that this false revival is not true and be converted to the true revival. Now, how much of it did you have to be responsible for? Not so much. Who's doing this work? God is doing this work. What he is asking of you, are you willing to be used by him for his glory? That's the decision you have to make in your hearts. Will I allow the power of God to be in me for his glory and not my glory? That people may come to the truth as it is in Christ Jesus and be saved. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Acacia. After I had been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. have to look at my notes here. Okay. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Remember, of course, that's Christianity. A silversmith named Demetrius, who had made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men? You know we received a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. I want to stop there just for a moment. Who would that fit in our little presentation about the remnant doing this? Who do you think the goddess Artemis is now being hailed, acknowledged? Because Artemis is the, god, is the goddess of fertility. She's the mother god, mother god. Who would be replacing Artemis now? Mary. Mary. And who would be attacking those people who are caught in Mariology? The remnant. Remember, this is Paul. 
And we have spread not only through Ephesus, but the whole Asia, and in this sense, we could say, have spread the truth about Artemis through the whole world. And because of that, what are we destroying? All the money that these religions are making off of who? Mary. And are they happy about that? No, they are not happy about that. Again, I want you to see in this story God's last day people. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Ah, oh, that must have been, they must have been really upset. Can you imagine shouting for two hours? What happened to their voices? So they were shouting for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Man of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a genuine grievance against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So who is this city clerk representing? The government. <laughs> so the city clerk is representing the government because this commotion over religious matters has become bad. And so now the government is going to have to step in to bring about peace and safety with these contending religious bodies. And we know that the one group is going to represent our Catholic friends. And the other group is representing us. And we are going to so irritate them. But maybe you're aware of it. How many of you watch Walter Weith? Some of you may know. And when you watch Walter Weith, he has some quotes from the Catholic Church. And in some of these quotes from the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church acknowledges only one competitor in the entire world, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That huge Goliath looks at this tiny David and as, looks at them and says, only this little denomination is our competitor in the world. Why? because we are giving the truth as it is in Jesus for these last days. Amen. We are giving the everlasting gospel. Strange as it seems, we as a 
denomination are the only ones giving the truth about the gospel. Because everyone else has, as we studied in our Sabbath school class today, faith and what? Works. Only do we understand the true nature of justification. Only we understand what Jesus did on the cross. Catholic, Orthodox, Protestants don't have that understanding even though they talk about grace. Because you cannot understand grace if you do not understand the law of God. Why was there a crucifixion? Why was there a death of the Son of God? Because the law was what? Broken. If there is no law, as they say there is no law, why would Jesus have to die? He wouldn't. Because without law, there is no sin. So why have a death for sin if there is no sin because there is no law? So the only ones out there who understand the truth are the ones who understand the law. Not as a means of salvation, but that it is the broken law that demanded the death of the Son of God. This truth is tearing up the rest of Christianity who are more interested in Artemis than they are in Christ Jesus. Well, we tried to make it, you know, no children's story, none of that. I don't know if that clock is right, but that clock says it's 12. And we've only begun our little trip. And the bigger, more important part of our trip is when Paul gets to Jerusalem. And we have miles to go before we get to Jerusalem, just even in these few verses here. I will take a little risk. I'm sure you will appreciate I don't know if you'll appreciate my little risk. So we're going to go on. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye and sent out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail for Syria. He decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Phyrus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also and Tychus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. And of course he says for us, because Luke is writing this, and so he's part of the us. So this Paul is still working his way to make it to Jerusalem. And a plot to kill him was stirred up. He hears about it and decides not to take the ship, but he's going to walk. So I want to read a little bit from what Ellen White has written in her The Life Sketches of Paul, starting with Paul's last journey. The apostle felt that he was forced by the opposition of his enemies and even by the course of his brethren to take a decided stand to maintain his position and authority. Paul greatly desired to reach Jerusalem before the Passover, as he would thus have an opportunity to meet the people who came from all parts of the world to attend the feast. He had a continual hope that in some way he might be instrumental in removing the prejudice of his countrymen so that they might accept the precious light of the gospel. 
He was also desirous of meeting the church at Jerusalem and bearing to them the liberalities donated by other churches to the poor brethren in Judea. And he hoped in this visit to bring about a firmer Christian union between the Jewish and Gentile converts to the faith. Having completed his work at Corinth, he determined to sail directly for one of the ports on the coast of Palestine. All his arrangements had been made, and he was about to step on board the ship when he was informed of a plot laid by the Jews to take his life. These opposers of the faith had been foiled in all their efforts to put an end to the apostles' work. Since the unsuccessful attempt to secure his condemnation by Gallio five years before, they had been unable to arouse the people or rulers against him. I'm stopping a little bit more. Paul is represented. Who is Paul representing here? Us, the remnant. Okay. And the remnant has spread all of this around. And the Jews, who would be the Jews in this case, other Christians, have failed to stop the work that the remnant is accomplishing. The work of the gospel had advanced despite their opposition. From every quarter there came accounts of the spread of the new doctrine by which Jews were released from their distinctive observances and Gentiles admitted to share their privileges as children of Adam. This you have to change a little bit here because what the remnant is bringing back is what, according to Revelation? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. We are bringing back the law and the prophets. And this the Christian world does not want to hear. And so in this weird kind of way, it's switched now. The success, and of course we're bringing back the Sabbath, and all of these people are Sunday keepers. From every quarter there came accounts of the spread of the new doctrine by which the Jews were released from their distinctive observances and Gentiles admitted to share equal privileges as the children of Abraham. The success attending the preaching of this doctrine. Now, I want you to understand just how Ellen White did this. She's talking about Paul, but what is it that is successful? Is it Paul or is it this doctrine? It's not us individually who are great and successful. It's the truth that we have that is changing people's hearts and minds. And we are just bearing and sharing that truth, and God, through that truth, changes hearts. The success attending the preaching of this doctrine, which, with all their hatred, they could not controvert. And isn't that the truth? You cannot find Sunday in the Bible. And as much as they hate this doctrine of the Sabbath, they can't controvert it because it isn't in the Bible. In fact, in our Sabbath school class, we brought together a very interesting legal thing. Paul mentions last will and testament. When can you change your last will and testament? While you're alive. Because the moment you're dead, you can't change it anymore. I mean, that would be obvious, but it's kind of weird. You can change your law, you can change your will, you can change your testament right up to when you die, but once you die, it's over with. How then can Sunday keepers say Jesus changed the law after he died? Because Sunday didn't come into being until the first day of the week when he rose. But you can't change it after he died. So legally, their whole idea that it was changed on that first day of the week, Sunday, is illegal. Jesus would have had to make the change before the cross. Did he make a change before the cross? Yes. 
What change did he make before the cross? The covenant meal. Until Jesus has that last supper in the upper room, the covenant meal had been with Israel, and it was the Passover meal. But the Jewish nation had rejected their Messiah. Therefore, Jesus institutes a new covenant meal, the Lord's Supper, and that covenant meal is now with his church. That was a change that he had made before his death. Ah, but going on. So, the success attending the preaching of this doctrine, which with all their hatred they could not controvert, stung the Jews to madness. That's the case it will be on Sunday legislation. Paul, in his preaching at Corinth, presented the same arguments which he urged so forcibly in his epistles. His strong statement, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor circumcision, was regarded by his enemies as daring blasphemy. They determined that his voice should be silenced. While he was under the protection of the Roman authorities, it might not be prudent to molest him, but they would have their revenge as soon as the ship had left the shore. It would not be a difficult matter to bribe captain or sailors to do the deed of violence. Upon receiving the warning of the plot, Paul decided to change his course and go round by Macedonia accompanied by a sufficient number of brethren to protect him. His plan to reach Jerusalem by the Passover had to be given up. He hoped to be there at Pentecost. An overruling providence permitted the apostle to be delayed on this occasion. A what? An overruling providence permitted the apostle to be delayed on this occasion, for had he been present at the Passover, he would have been accused of instigating a riot and massacre, which was caused by the pretensions of an Egyptian imposter claiming to be the Messiah. Are we not also going to expect as Jesus said, many false Christs to appear. And God's overriding providences will prevent us from being mixed in with these false Jesuses and these false messiahs so that his truth will continue to go through protected, guarded, uncontaminated by the false preachings and the false individuals that are out there. This is where we're going. And we are soon, soon to be in the new Jerusalem. This is the remnant's last journey. The signs of the times are all around us in the most bizarre and crazy ways, telling us this is the last march. This is the last walk. This is our last trip to the new Jerusalem. Amen. Uriel, I guess, song. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, there, and as Frank was saying, in National Ge Geographic, there was an article on six people claiming to be the Messiah or Christ are roaming this planet now. You're only going to see that even get crazier. It's going to get everything. There was one other sign of the times while he's there that I didn't, want to sh that I didn't share with you, but I do want to do it now. There was a sports writer and I know none of you are watching any sports because you're all good Adventists, and you wouldn't be caught listening to sports things. But this sports writer was talking about the professional basketball league, and he was talking about the team, the Golden State Warriors, 
and he was saying the Golden State Warriors had done something to professional basketball. Now, I think most of you are familiar, even when you were children, of those little glass globes that had a little scene inside the glass globe, and it was filled with liquid, and if you turned it upside down, little white things would all come down, and if you would shake it, it would be like a, you know, a winter scene as the snowflakes are going all over the place. And he said these Golden State Warriors have taken the professional thing and shaken it up so that everything is all out of confusion and craziness. Well, that's sports, but believe me, this whole world is like one of those little globes. And it is being shaken and everything, whether it's politics, science, religion, education, finances, economics, is all being shaken up and all you see are little flecks of everything in chaos and confusion. That's where we are, except one spot, the remnant church. But we're not to the end of the story, so you need to come back next week. Tip of the iceberg. We have one hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Let's stand for 522, my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all on the ground is sinking sand. All on the ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All on the ground is sinking sand All on the ground is sinking sand Support me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All on the ground is sinking sand All on the ground is sinking sand shall come with trumpet sound, who oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all on the ground is sinking sand, all on the ground is sinking sand. Heavenly Father, let it truly be said of us that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. He is our solid rock. There is no other place for us to be. But Father, give us that special blessing of thy spirit that we may show forth thy glory and the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to those who are in darkness, that we may lead them upon the path of righteousness and walk together 
to the new Jerusalem is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.